Good evening, everyone. I, I, I hope people can, can hear us uh, and, and welcome everybody to, um, to, to this event. I'm, I'm Christopher Kramer. I'm the Professor of the Political Economy of Development uh, at SOAS. And I'm here to, uh, to welcome you all to the fourth event in this SOAS, University of London, series called Continuing the Conversation. And so as we'll be host hosting more virtual events in the upcoming months, uh, this event, like others, will be recorded. And, and um, I'm advised to ask you if you're so minded to, to discuss this on social media. Uh, please could you use the following hashtags, which I think are spelt out in the chat function on the sidebar. Hashtag SOAS, hashtag, hashtag SOAS alumni, and hashtag we are SOAS. So, today's event will be Dr. Gus Casely Hayford, OBE, in conversation with me, discussing the slightly daunting topic we were given of art, history, Africa, and the world. So, <laughs> Gus and I will have a discussion. We'll chat for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we will open up for a Q&A. Uh, and, and we'd like you, if you've got questions, please to write them in the chat box to the right and then we'll try and uh, gather in as, as many of those as, as, as we can. So it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Dr. Gus Casely Hayford um, to this event and, and, and back to SOAS. Gus, for those of you who might not know enough, is an art and cultural historian who writes, lectures, curates and broadcasts widely and particularly on African culture and history. He's perhaps especially well known for his, for his major BBC TV series, The Lost Kingdoms of Africa. If you haven't seen it, find it, it's fantastic. These were series that used new archeological and anthropological research to explore the pre-colonial history of some of Africa's most important kingdoms. Among many other things that we might mention, Gus is a former executive director of art strategy for, art, for the Arts Council England. He's a former director of the Institute of International Visual Art, and he's advised the United Nations and the Canadian, Dutch, and Norwegian Arts Councils, as well as the Tate Gallery. He initiated and he became the director of Africa 05, which was the largest African arts season ever hosted in the UK, when more than 150 venues collaborated to host more than 1,000 events nationwide. Uh, Gus is, Dr. Casey Hayford is, is, is now leading the development of a really exciting, one of the biggest cultural projects that's been undertaken by a national museum in the UK in recent years. And we'll find out a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, that's the VNA East project. And he has recently uh, returned from being the director of the, the National Gallery of, of African Art at the Smithsonian in Washington. Gus, it's fantastic to, to welcome you back to SOAS, even if virtually, uh, and, and to the UK. I think, I think the last time we actually saw each other in, in person was, was in the staff common room at SOAS when you were on a short work flight trip back from Washington. And both of those things are kind of strange things to, to think of or say now, it's a different world. <laughs> Short flights and work trips across the, uh, the ocean, um, hanging out in the staff common room. And I, I, I think that different world is something that we'll, um, we'll probably, we'll come to, the implications of that for, for, for the world we live in and the work that we, and you in particular, are doing. But maybe I could um, begin with some of the basics, Gus, and ask you, because I think I and, and many of us will, will want to know a little bit more, if you could tell us a little bit about VNA East, about the, the origins of this idea, uh, about what stage it's at, and when it's open. I'm, it's being built within eye shot and ear shot of, of where I'm sitting now, but, but, but tell us more about VNA East. And when I, I love my role um, at the Smithsonian, and when I got a call from, um, um, from the senior team at the VNA, um, it was probably the only offer I think that would have pulled me away from 
my role at the National Museum of African Art because it was to do something which is both daunting and exciting in equal measure. It's to help to deliver a new museum and collection centre um, in the east of London. And it's an area which was traditionally fairly, um, fairly kind of deprived. Um, in the 1850s, um, at the time of the Great Exhibition, which was the forerunner of, 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 of of uh, the v &A, that one of the great punch journalists, um, Henry Mayhew, that he travels in the um, east of London and he describes it as an area which is utterly run down, but he also mm. describes it as an area which is absolutely kind of driven by makers, that he finds it this place in which there are all kinds of weavers and carpenters. Um, and it's this engine of creativity which is fueling this transformation of, 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 of Britain. And it's at this moment in which Britain, London is engaging in this reflection of its place in the world through creative process and the great exhibition becomes a kind of moment in which Britain establishes a new relationship to the world through creativity and the VNA is one of the the results of that and it's an institution which I've always loved but this was a chance to create a new iteration of the VNA, but to do it in this bit of London, which has been so traditionally neglected and yet which has produced some of the great creative um, forces in British um, cultural history. And I just thought, what a fantastic proposition, a chance to build an institution that would house 250,000 objects from the VNA collection um, 900 archives in a vast collection centre, which is the size of a football field. I stood in it just last week and it is utterly awe-inspiring. It is one of those buildings, like when you go into the Great Court of the British Museum, that just takes your breath away. And then about 10 minutes walk away, a new museum, um, which will be on four floors, within which we will be able to animate those works from the collection, as well as other works, new works, as well as, as commissioning works by artists. And, it, and doing it in this bit of London that has been so traditionally neglected, it was just an offer that I couldn't turn down. So I'm so excited, daunted by the prospect, but so excited. That's fantastic, Gus. When, when's it due to be open to the rest of us? You've been given sneak previews of the, the building site and so on, but when, when do we all get to be able to go along? So, uh, 2024 will be the date at which the collection centre is is due to, to to open, and that is this vast building within which we will house a large proportion of the VNA collection. Um, uh, but it will be unlike any other collection centre in which it will be accessible to to anyone, and it's an amazing design that it feels like. Um, one has somehow peeled open a collection centre, glass floors, glass walls um, in, in, in a large, uh, in, in large area of the actual central um, um, space. So you can stand in the centre of the, of the building and you can look up and you can look down and you can see this amazing collection, quarter of a million objects in a single space. Um, and then a year later in 2025, um, this um, amazing new um, museum um, designed by um, McConnell and Toomey, um, which is based on a Valenciaga dress, um, incredibly beautiful as well. And it's in a constellation of new buildings alongside a, 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 a new, um, space for the BBC um, orchestras, um, Sadler's Wells, a new building um, uh, um, which will also be there, a new theatre, um, and London College of Fashion, 
a new site for them, and also not too far away, a new university college, um, so a new UCL. So this new suite of institutions all celebrating creativity in different ways, but also at this moment in which post-Brexit, post-Covid, as we begin to define a new place for Britain in the world, a new space in which creativity is going to have to find ways of, of, of bridging the gap between communities, whether that be, you know, across oceans or whether, you know, that be kind of, um, you know, just um, locally, because what COVID has done, you know, what Brexit has done is kind of is to change geography. And I think that we need institutions that are capable of bridging some of those those those, those boundaries. That, 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 so if we just take the sort of the local bit of that, um, will the new the collection and the museum, what will their, apart from the historical link, it's really interesting that you were talking about Mayhew and the Great Exhibition and the beginnings of the DNA. Will the link refer directly to that and build on it? Will it, will it be a major source of local employment? Will, it, will the collection of the museum reflect that particular East London uh, history and culture in particular ways or, or not so much? Well, well I'm hoping that the, the disciplines that um, are explored in the V&A collection are some of the sorts of disciplines that you see reflected in, in local industry. You know, th this is an area which has given birth to large numbers of, 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 of fashion designers, of architects, of of, of, of ceramicists, um, and I am hoping that this our space will become a sort of creative repository in which people can dip in and they can use it as um, a crucible of, of, of ideas. But I'm also hoping that for the young, for people who aren't formally engaged in, 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 ed, in, in, in creative education, that they're not kind of an art college, um, and they're not professionally kind of engaged in, in, in the arts, that for them it might be just an opportunity to see what some of the finest practice across time and across geography mm. is actually like to be in the presence of. And mm. I would hope that that generation who are doing amazing things in so many areas, particularly in helping us to think about how we're going to navigate um, the digital, that they will be there to help us to call to, to 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 think and to consider what new avenues and opportunities for creative practice in these disciplines might actually be ways in which we can actually um, actually make the world feel smaller in this time in which they feel like there are increasing boundaries and barriers to travel, um, and I would really love to engage those communities in helping us to explore our collections and to give them the tools to actually redefine some of these disciplines themselves. I think that is enormously exciting. If one thinks of one of the sorts of people who, who, who benefited from a local education here in Europe, in Newham, Alexander McQueen, someone who completely um, took apart the constituent parts of fashion and put them back together in ways that made sense to him and so transformed the whole discipline. And I think that there are so many other people who, given the tools, could help us to reconsider so many areas of creative practice. And we want to give this younger generation the tools and to do it in a part of London which is incredibly culturally diverse. You know, these, all of the surrounding barriers are ethnic majority boroughs. You know, some of them are deeply um, uh, underinvested in, you know, poor infrastructure. And we want to be there to support young people in realizing their dreams and doing it in ways that actually work for them. That's fantastic, Gus. And you mentioned Alexander McQueen, and of course, there was that. Brilliant celebration of his work by the VNA um, a few years ago, which was a really astonishing exhibition. But you, the other thing that you've been talking about, which is so interesting, is is 
the role of something like the VNA in in a process of Britain trying to to know, to understand, to find its its place in the world. And and there are a couple of things I think interesting about that. I mean, one is more generally, um, you know, everything about who we who we think we are uh, as communities, as groups of people, as countries, the the stories we tell ourselves about who we are the the relationships of power within the country and, and and globally all of these are bound up with issues of memory of what we remember and how we remember it and and also what we forget and how we remember it and who chooses that so and it, it seems to me there's a very particular moment right now very obviously around blm and the states and here and so on but there's a sort of opportunity to reshuffle those questions and i i, I wonder what you think about the, the broader role of, of of galleries museums and particularly the vna in 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 contributing to that that very important process well, and the, the vna comes out of a particular tradition of of museums you know that we are we are enlightenment um institutions that that we you know it's difficult but we have we have written into our histories you know periods in which we were engaged in you know either tangentially or directly in supporting colonial regimes in actually supporting the higher the hierarchies and the categorizations of peoples and cultures in ways which now feel very uncomfortable and mm. what we have an opportunity of doing today is particularly through our collections is in um interrogating some of that and actually doing it in ways which actually empower people who feel particularly genetically connected to the works which are in our collections and helping them to build much more complex and robust interfaces with our collections that are personal sometimes but i think underwritten by a kind of 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 intellectual integrity which i think can sometimes feel um quite distant in museums you know that museums they shouldn't just be there to um i don't know but that very often at museums it can feel like you are there just to to learn lessons and i think very often that the people who visit institutions that they have as much if not more to impart about the experience about particular objects as anyone else and i just feel that what i would love to do is to create an environment in which we can use digital tools to actually create environments around objects and collections in which we can all engage it of course we have to we have to respect a curatorial authority. But around that, I would love it if objects become spaces for wider discourse and interactivity that can be personal, which may be you know, deeply um, subjective, but which will allow us to, to realize the kind of contingent nature of what we do, but to both speak to the poetry of curation, but also to underpin it with a kind of meaning that I think um, sometimes can be lacking. And so I would love it if this feels like a partnership with the public in which we are rediscovering these collections, rediscovering and rethinking our connection to this problematic and difficult history. It's not about us actually resolving things in ways that will feel safe sanitized and comfortable it's about us actually using our collections to ask some difficult questions and for us to in some way navigate some of this space in ways that may be cathartic to some and for others may actually raise important questions and i think museums shouldn't just be repositories of nice things in which one goes and one reflects and one comes away kind of unchanged. I think occasionally museums need to be spaces in which really robust questions are asked. And some of those questions need to be asked and answered by the public themselves in their own 
way using the spaces that the museums facilitate so that we become crucibles for change, crucibles of catharsis. Oh, sorry, I think oh, Chris, we've lost Chris. So please do submit your questions and I will, I will self-moderate. So Chili Horse has, has asked, what will the opening exhibition be? At the moment, we are, what, four years away from opening. And so we, um, we aren't in a position to, 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 to actually say, I have some ideas. But if you imagine that V&A South Ken, that they have had this incredible heritage, this amazing history of Dior and McQueen and we want to be able to deliver a level of exhibition that rivals those in kind of name recognition, but which does so in an area which will speak to some new audiences, that really will speak to some of the local people, but also to so many people who wouldn't feel um, a museum visit to be the natural thing that they would want to do. So I'm really excited about developing that program and I at some point hopefully next year will be, be able to begin to speak publicly about that program. So, the, so this is from Sandra Wilson. The V&A has very few African artifacts in its collection. How do you hope to address that de deficit? Which is a really good question. But one of the things I found, because I began my career at the British Museum, and we would often look with see at the V&A collection. I can remember looking at their yinkers. They have, you know, and thinking, wow, you know, it would be great if we were to acquire, you know, that Victorian dandy se series when the V&A were acquiring it. And so even though traditionally there hasn't been an Africa curator, hidden away in a number of different departments, there are significant numbers of really, really wonderful things around which one can can um, build a really um, good Africa collection. In the 1950s, um, something called the Circulation Department was developed at the v &A, which was a department which was designed to take the collection out beyond the actual South Ken area and actually take it to the people who were paying for the, the institution. And it went out across Britain to all the regions and was incredibly popular. And the people who who, who conceived and actually ran the circulation department, they actually drove an acquisition policy which was about widening the brief. And they bought quite a lot of African um, works. And they are now the basis of a very good collection. But I want, over the course of my tenure, to build upon that. And we have um, coming up um, an uh, African fashion exhibition, which I'm really looking forward to, but also that we are looking at some major acquisitions and loans, which I think will begin to reshape the way in which we see, um, we, we, we see the V&A. Um, so, yeah, a for a answer. Um, I'm guessing a fellow Ghanaian. How do we address the concerns, issues of artifacts taken in the past and request to have them returned to their home countries in Africa? And, and I think that this is another key question, and it's something which um, our director, Tristram Hunt, has actually taken the lead on in building those relationships and beginning to find the ways of answering some of these really substantive questions. And I'm really fortunate when I began my career, these are questions which one asked in kind of lower tones because it, you know, there wasn't really the spaces in which one could engage in these conversations openly. And I think, but today, today, Hartwig Fisher, Tristram Hunt, the directors of all of the major major collections that they that that have um, large repositories of objects um, from Africa clone that they are 
all working in different ways to think about how we create greater equity, greater sharing um, in this particular area. And I think that we will live through a time in which this is less of an issue, in which both on the continent that there is a new generation of national museums that are, are, are co-creating exhibitions, in which we're sharing expertise, and in which that critical thing of in which we are loaning objects and we are building a collection which does not feel like it needs to have the stamp of any single institution on it that is truly you know, a global, which I think is very much something that we would all love to see. And now, and I'm sorry I can't get to all of the questions because I'm trying to self-moderate and I have never used this system before. So I'm just going down as I see them. Uh, Miles Wickstead, hi Gus, big question. To what extent do you think culture and an understanding of heritage can contribute towards the sustainable development goals? And in particular, the promotional, the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies. That's a great question, Miles. And, I, and I, when I look at the that generation of founders of institutions. Oh, Chris, you're back. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sort of back. Uh, I think Soas needs to buy me a new computer. <laughs> and I can't, but I can't see, I can't actually see Miles's or anybody else's questions in the chat. So um, if you don't mind, Gus, you're going to have to probably field them until I can see them. But, okay. But carry on. Answer answering Miles's question, which was, it's a really good one, understanding, um, you know, how do, to what extent do you think culture and an understanding of heritage and culture can contribute to the sustainable development goals, and in particular, promote the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've, I've served on the board of the National Trust. Um, I've worked for the British Museum. I've advised Tate. I've um, worked for the Arts Council. You know, I've worked for a number of different major national institutions in Britain. And what they all seem to have in common is if, if you actually go back to their founding objectives, they, even though they're all driven by this idea of the intrinsic value of the arts, of the arts being about something which is um, about lifting us through beauty, they all also were driven by another imperative of wanting to find ways of getting society to, to work better, of us to cohere better, to, to drive social cohesion, to help to facilitate um, greater education and opportunity for disadvantaged peoples all of those institutions that they had a transformative component to a social inclusion component to their actual th founding thesis and it may well be that now we've confined an awful lot of those kinds of drives to you know v uh, you know to our diversity action plans but they were pretty much part of our formal founding objectives and so Absolutely. With VNA East, we are embracing that as key and core. You know, equity, openness, you know, these will be things that will be absolutely formally part of our founding objectives, as well as sustainability. We can't create an institution today which does not in some way engage with its responsibility to, 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 to the world and the environment. So. It's a really good question, and it underpins so much of what I want to see VNA East represent. Um, um, Af Afar Hussein, how how could we be more effective towards intellectual collection to the participation role in the society and public domain? So, um, so how can we make our collections? Feel more relevant to wider a wider public. I'm, I'm I'm going to interpret that in that way. And and I think for me this is the key question that 
you know, one looks at our collection, quarter of a million objects, 5,000 years of history, the responsibility of, the, of that. And we hold those objects in trust on behalf of the British public. And we hold them in trust also on the basis that we try to engage the public in those narratives. And so fundamental to what we are here to, to, to do is to actually engage the public, is to actually activate those objects through a kind of relationship with our constituency. And it's in that space that public institutions become more than just, more than just repositories of ideas and nice things. It's there that they become active crucibles with the potential of both building and driving social cohesion, but also doing that critical thing that we need, I think, more than ever, which is driving change, driving, driving the potential for real discourse and to do it through a space that feels inclusive. And that is what I think great museums can do. And if one can do that through beauty, I mean, wow, I think that's really exciting. Gus, uh, Nick Westcott, who's, who's the director of the Royal Africa Society, is yes. probably asking you what your approach is to, to um, the demand for the return of, of cultural, cultural uh, objects. Yes, and I, I did try to answer that, that this okay. is something that, um, you know, I, I, that a wide range of, of, uh, of museums are considering at the moment and considering as consortia but also considering individually and when I was at um, the National Museum of African Art that we we actually um, commissioned a survey that looked at the state of of museums um, in Africa and we you know it it is devastating when one looks at the way in which there are some exquisite museums on the continent of Africa, but there are also, there is also kind of um, a vast number which are failing catastrophically. And we have to find a way of equalizing that. We have to find a way of, of sharing, of returning, of engaging with debate, of, of exchanging um, expertise, of, we have to find a way of opening up the conduits and of creating greater equity. I mean, it's difficult to work in a sector in which we are trying to celebrate um, education and expertise, um, which is which are all based around the idea of having a kind of equitable um, playing field, of having opportunity, of having a space in which one can share. And then for there to be such inequity of delivery and particularly for people who feel genealogically connected to the very materials that we are discussing we have to find ways of equalizing some of that presumably one of the things that underpins some of the, the difficulties of, of of some of the institutions that you've mentioned is is straightforwardly a problem of public finance capacity in in, in some of those countries and do, do you think that there's more that could be done either by multilateral organizations, World Bank or so, so on, or bilateral in terms of the newly merged FCO and, and DFID here in the UK to support the arts, the arts, cultures, museums, uh, memorialization within African countries. Well, if, you, if one looks at the cultural industries in Britain and the high proportion of, uh, of GDP that is generated by the cultural sector. I would have thought that for World Bank, the idea that you know they had culture there as one of their their their, their key um, uh, their key priorities, but it is way down the list. And I do feel that a reinvestment in that would really be kind of strategically important at this time. And one looks at nations which have gone in that direction, and it has yielded, you know, fantastic benefits. I look at, you know, some of the 
some of the new galleries, some of them commercial. One looks at a place like Johannesburg, and mm. um, you know there, you know there, there are a number of commercial galleries. One looks at um, Cape Town, you know there, you know Zeitz Mocker doing incredible mm. things, you know, and then the Norval Foundation, just you know, an, another world class institution not far away, and it's amazing how quickly whole sectors can be transformed and across the continent these new institutions have grown simultaneously with a whole new generation of african artists who are doing utterly astounding things rewriting the you know what everyone expected might be possible in terms of in terms of sales in terms of representation in terms of the the, the way in which they're actually being placed within um, the big global art fairs. So I think the future does not need to be like the past. I feel so optimistic about the African art sector. And, you know, I will, whilst I'm in this role, be really keen to be working with institutions across the continent and doing it to bring the, the best practice here, but also trying where I can to help to 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 it to share expertise um but also just in any way that i can to help to transform the op opportunities of 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 the younger generation of curators and artists i mean i think that that just what you said just then may may be the beginning of uh of answers to um two of the questions uh, on, on the right hand side one what one, one from, from vanessa kyle about diversity uh within the workforce of museums and galleries including the DNA, and the other above from Arike, okay about um what what discourses what themes you particularly want to use the vna brand and collections to engage with i think that may touch on some of what you were just saying well i I want to, you know, and I have a responsibility to to try to touch as many people, particularly young people, as I possibly can through this incredibly accessible and glorious collection. And so, uh, you know, for me, I still think back on my first museum experiences as, you know, wonderful but slightly daunting. So my hope is that we can create an environment which is welcoming but at the same time that it offers people a chance from their very initial visit to when they are major practitioners who are celebrated around the world a space in which they can absolutely kind of um, ex execute their dreams that they can feel that we can walk in lockstep with people toward their aspirations and you know one looks at the great collections and you know that they can often feel somewhat distant they can i can always remember as a young person going into museums and galleries and somehow feeling you know that either it was a privilege to be there or or feeling slightly like um i wasn't actually welcome and i want that absolutely not to be the case this needs to be an environment in which particularly those local people feel like it is there absolutely world-class collections world-class curation but it belongs to those local people and you know one looks back at the history of the sorts of people who come from this bit of london and they've contributed so much mm. to 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 the cultural well-being of, of of britain to its gdp but they've had so little in return i think this is a tiny reinvestment in a community that have been so long overlooked and so i just feel it's such a privilege to be a part of that narrative so picking up on that lewis tony is asking whether whether there are plans for vne vna east to, to work with ucl east and yes. uh, also the slade and and also with my own hat on with people working in art history and music and media at SOAS as well. Even though oh, we're a little. Yeah, well, yes, was well, Slade, yeah, absolutely through UCL. Um, we will, you know, we are building a, a, a partnership, and my hope is that there will be um, uh, collaborations on courses and all sorts of, 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 of different programming. So we are so privileged to be in this. 
amazing neighborhood of of incredibly diverse local population but also these very dynamic other institutions um who we're going to work together with so that could you imagine the bbc with all of their orchestras mm. one has london college of fashion with all of its expertise one has sadler's worlds one of the most innovative um theater production um companies in the world and all of us with this absolute same aim that we will through excellence inspire a new generation and i want vna east to be absolutely at the center of that that this is of course it's about bringing the great experts to vna east bringing the superstars to vna east but it's also about giving a platform bringing in audiences who may never have felt welcome in in or comfortable in a museum for them to feel that it's theirs i think that is the exciting thing to build a new kind of museum paradigm in which we can all see ourselves reflected and all feel comfortable i think that is something that if we manage to do that i think it'll be really it'll be something that would be revolutionary in the way that henry cole the founder of the vna would have felt very proud that's what he I think it wanted to engage with this idea of making being almost like um, it, of it being more than a campaign of it being something that he wanted to evangelize about. He saw making as being a kind of way of emancipating people from um, uh, from from um, a lack of a, a lack of professional flexibility, having skills in which people can actually realize their own dreams was something that he wanted to, 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 to offer to a generation. And I would love it if we could find ways of doing that in this moment in which we are empowered through digital tools to offer global solutions. That's really exciting to me. It's interesting, Gus, that you know, that you've emphasized so much the, the making history of, of the area. And of course, uh, one of the things is more recently is that a lot of that making has disappeared and has been replaced by um, by living rather than making you know as, a, as the residential blocks are displacing some of the some of them rather beautiful old warehouses and stuff but there are also there is also this history of, of studios of artists working mm. locally the other thing that you haven't mentioned which is a hotbed of superstars and uh, at least according to some people great creativity on on, on field is west ham um yeah. the, <laughs> I wonder whether you can use that opportunity to, to reach a new audience as well. Yeah, and, and West Ham, that they have huge audiences, and we're also kind of adjacent to Westfield, one of the biggest shopping yeah. centres in, 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 in Britain. So it's, there are all of these different kinds of de demographies who converge on the old Olympic Park, and it's to find ways of them not feeling like they need to be exclusive to one another. I would love it if this particular cultural area becomes a point of confluence for all of these different demographies and not as a kind of place in which one is going to go and see something strange, which feels like a privilege, but to go and to go into a place that you can relax in and that you can see yourself occasionally reflected, but you can see usually amazing things that are delivered by some of the great creative um, forces in the world but presented in ways that feel like they are closer to you rather than further away mm -hmm. you know that kind of it's great that we reify and we put people and objects on plinths i also want to make them feel like they are accessible and that you could potentially pursue a similar course that it might not be that you can be a creative genius but you can we can all engage in 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 exercising our creative imaginations in different ways and i want this to be a space in which we can answer and ask some of those sorts of questions um, lucy charles is asking how you and your team have managed to to keep working on this project during the pandemic <laughs> well i actually flew back to london from washington dc the the on the very last plane 
um, from DC. It was just my cat and myself. Um, and um, I came back and then there was lockdown. And um, my wife and my daughter and I, that we are sharing the smallest flat in, in, in our bit of North London, I imagine. And so um, when I realized that, I thought, how am I going to fashion an office? And the only space that I could find was is is a kind of small linen cupboard which I've converted into my office, mm. um, and you know that is where I work from. Thankfully, um, three weeks ago, we began to open up bits of um, our office down in East London, and I'm sitting now in um, um, Plexal, which is a shared office space. Um, where we'll be working as we begin the transformation of our two spaces. And I come in here a few days a week. But I think one of the things that the lockdown period has done is it's changed, I think, some working practices, possibly for good. Mm. Um, and it's made us realize that we can do this sort of thing and it is enormously effective. It's great to speak to people across the world in real time and to engage with communities. And it's it's exactly the way in which we want our museum to work, that the things that we share by way of ideas can help us to actually in some way um, overcome distance and overcome mm -hmm. difference. And that is what will help us to in some way deal with many of the kind of it's not just the post-COVID challenges, but also for us to think about how we live sustainably in this world, that we don't always want to be traveling to, 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 to far off locations, as attractive as it is. If we can find ways to engage through digital spaces and to be creative and to be productive, I think that's enormously effective. And what this period has done is it has consultined our learning in ways that have um, forced us to actually to, 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 to deal with things that may have taken generations for us to take on. So, so, it'll, accelerate. so it'll accelerate changes. I mean, uh, it's, yes. you know, you can go to the Vatican or wherever digitally and you can get quite closer. And it's, and it's great, but it's, it's often not quite great enough. So it's not just the quality of the imagery. It's probably got to be other technical changes, haven't they, to presenting collections and material to, to do what you want and reduce distance. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm enormously excited and daunted by this responsibility. And, and it's in part, you know, that it's not often that one gets a chance to engage with the possibility of creating a new public institution. And what publics are demanding of their institutions has has changed over the last 150 years. And we need to deliver a kind of museological proposition that speaks to 21st century needs. You know, what is it that, um, you know, Gen Z are demanding, you know, in their cultural space that it, it, it is something utterly different than, 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 than my generation. So we've got a lot to learn um, from our audiences. And so I want to spend time listening and I want the institution to be reflective and dynamic and open to the possibility of change because it's such an exciting time. And the institutions that get this right, I think will create a different kind of musical, museological proposition. And I think that is enormously exciting. There's, there's a question um, from Kenneth at the, at the Africa Center, and, and this yes. may be our last question. Um, and, and Kenneth's asking, um, the, you know, the question is not just about changing narratives, but, but, but who owns and who gets to own and how those narratives. I don't know whether you have anything to... Absolutely. Uh, and one of the great privileges is that we're, well, it's, we're living through this period of of great challenge you know that as we come out of lockdown and our economy is is going through a period of of, of some contraction and 
we, you know, I feel very fortunate in which, you know, being in a position in which we are part of an institution which is, you know, like Kenneth, which is, 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 is growing and is trying to um, um, uh, employ um, new, new staff members. And so for us, we feel that we have a responsibility to make sure that that those teams that they reflect this new moment and this new generation and so i i am hopeful and i you know that we will find a way of of engaging with this opportunity because i think anything else would be deemed to have you know to have been a failure that we need to find ways of employing not just the same sorts of people that one sees in so many institutions mm -hmm. but to, it's not just about demographic profile it's also about mindset that we need to create a new moment for museums in which we can we can really engage with that generation many of whom you know gen z you see them turning away from you know so much um, um cultural practice that is produced um, by the older generation because they feel somehow that we've let them down and I want to find a way of building a bridge across between us and that generation which is and, the, and the, that is a generation which, that is driven by the idea of 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 kind of cultural integrity you know that they embrace the ideas of sustainability and equity really fundamentally and I want to see us doing the same institutionally and one looks back across the history of the development of national institutions. You look at the initial development of the British Museum, of the VNA, of, of, of the National Trust, and they are driven by that same moral compunction. And I think that us, as we found our new museum, it has to be as well as um, an institution which is underwritten by by excellence, it has to be underwritten by equity and it has to be underwritten by an ethical code. Those things have to go together. Thank you, Gus. Um, I, I think we're pretty much out of, out of time. I think these are the issues that you've raised and that people have asked you about. They're, they're really important issues. They're part of a, an ongoing and open conversation that I hope that, that we'll all be, continue to be involved in. Um, I think you've given us some, some, some really inspiring thoughts about the new project, about VNA East, and it's, it's placed specifically in London, but also VNA's role, London, the UK's place in the world more broadly as we try to, to rethink through that. It's clearly a, an incredibly exciting project, and I think we're all amazingly lucky that you came back for this. Oh, thank you. Um, we, we really look forward to, to, to seeing this come to fruition and, and opening in a few years time. It's great you're back and, and I personally, and I know all of us at SOAS, very much look forward to, uh, to staying in touch with you and, and seeing you uh, digitally and hopefully in, in person soon. But Gus, um, I'd like to, on behalf of everybody, thank you very, very much for joining us and to thank everybody who, who, who's joined in who's listened, who's posted questions. Thank you all. Um, remind everybody that this session is recorded if you want to watch back over parts of it. And, and on my part to uh, apologize for my technical uh, utter failure earlier on, but lovely to reconnect. But thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone. I've looked at so many of the names of people who are people who I love, adore, respect, and it's so wonderful to be in touch with you, even if it be, you know, remotely in this way. And please, you know, be in touch and come and see us at the NAE and support SOAS. It's an institution that made me that I absolutely, I adore, and I cannot think of ways of repaying the investment that it's, it, it's made in me. And so, you know, if there are ways in which you can support SOAS, you know, I, it would make me so happy if that was the result of, of this evening. It's an institution that I feel so privileged to have been a part of. And thank you again, Chris. You've been throughout my career such a supporter. And, you know, I'm so grateful to you for your friendship, for your loyalty, and just the inspirational work that you do at SOAS. You know, it sets a bar, sets, you know, shines a light for a generation 
Um, and I just feel, you know, so as it might be that we're going through a challenging time, but mm. what it does is so important. And I feel so privileged to have been, uh, um, to have had the benefit of an education there. And I hope that many other students will also have that benefit over many generations to come. Thanks, Garth. We're, we are all at SOAS hugely grateful for your support and, and that of everybody like you. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.